Hi everybody, it's Mr. Wester, and we're back today to finish our discussion of the Battle of Gettysburg. So we are up to the third day of the battle. Uh, we've discussed some of the major events for the first two days, so now we're going to see what happened uh, on the final day. So yesterday you'll recall, recall we left. Uh, So yesterday, you'll recall that we left off on Culp's Hill with General Green trying to sort of deceive the enemy, try to make sure that uh, they thought he had more men than he actually did, and try to convince them that he wasn't as outnumbered as he really was. So on the third day, that's where fighting resumes first. It resumes over on the slopes of Culp's Hill. Uh, so it says, the morning of July 3rd, 1863, began with the resumption of fierce fighting among the soldiers on Culp's Hill. Both sides had been reinforced during the night, and General Edward Johnson's Confederate troops came within 30 feet of the Union position at the top of the hill. 30 feet, 10 yards. So think about that. Like from the 10-yard line to the goal on a football field, 30 feet, that close to the Union position, they were basically face to face right in front of each other. Like the 20th Main on Little Round Top one day earlier, the 66th Ohio Infantry bravely left their position and charged down the hill toward the Confederate troops, pushing the Confederates back down the hill. But we remember the 20th Main. Not many people have heard of the 66th Ohio. Uh, and it just serves sort of as a reminder that what we see in the movies, what we see maybe in a documentary or read in a book, doesn't always tell the whole story. So I like kind of mentioning the 66th Ohio because they often get forgotten. Uh, their commander wasn't quite as literate perhaps as Colonel Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain, we mentioned, was a professor before he joined the army. Uh, so he was very, very well written. He was able to go back and write well about his uh, experiences and tell people about what he had done. Uh, I don't really know much about the commander of the 66th Ohio, so I'm not sure. Uh, what his story was, but clearly uh, Chamberlain is remembered and well-remembered, while the commander of the 66th Ohio and his troops uh, often sort of get overlooked. But because of that action, much like what happened on the slopes of Little Round Top the day before, uh, by 10 o'clock that morning, Culp's Hill was safely back in Union hands, so the Union bayonet charge once again worked really well and uh, served its purpose. So Culp's Hill fighting is over by 10 o'clock that morning. Now, before we leave Culp's Hill, I want to talk about some of the folks who were fighting there, uh, specifically or one of the folks, because his name was Wesley Culp. And you see Wesley over there. Okay. There's Wesley. And I have two other people pictured here. I have Jack Skelly, and then right behind me here, I have Jenny Wade. Now, if you didn't already notice, Wesley Culp's last name is shared with Culp's Hill. And the reason for that is Wesley Culp had grown up in the town of Gettysburg. Culp's Hill was on his uncle's land, uh, and it had been named after Wesley's family. So Wesley grew up as a young kid, like any of us might have, uh, kind of exploring the woods and playing outside, playing on the slopes of this hill, playing on this beautiful landscape, uh, and exploring these woodlands. So Wesley grew up and he decided he was going to move to Virginia. He found a good job in Virginia, decided to leave Gettysburg, go live in Virginia uh, for his new job. And when the war erupted in 1861, Wesley made the choice to stay loyal to his new home of Virginia rather than to his birthplace in Pennsylvania. And since Virginia was a Confederate state, that means Wesley joined the Confederate Army. So, uh, by a strange coincidence, Wesley found himself back in his hometown on July, 3rd, July 2nd and 3rd, 1863, and sadly, Wesley Culp died on Culp's Hill uh, on July 3rd, uh, the same ground where he had played and explored as a young boy. Uh, this is the place where he lost his life, sadly. Uh, but the story doesn't end there, because prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, Wesley had been fighting with the Confederate Army in Virginia, around uh, the city of Winchester, Virginia. And another friend that he had had growing up, or a friend that he had had growing up, was a man named Jack Skelly. And Jack was fighting for the Union Army. Jack had stayed in Pennsylvania, stayed in Gettysburg, and was fighting for the Union. And Wesley found out that his friend, his good friend from childhood, uh, had been severely wounded. Uh, so Wesley went to see him. 
and Jack had given Wesley something to a letter to take home and he said if you ever find your way back to Gettysburg if you ever find your way home could you please make sure Jenny gets this letter because Jenny happened to be Jack's fiance and here's Jenny Wade now Wesley didn't expect to find his way back to Gettysburg anytime soon, but sure enough, a few weeks later, the army marches home to Gettysburg for him. And so he's marching with that letter for Jenny from Jack, who had since died, uh, along with him. So he was hoping that maybe, once he realized he was in Gettysburg again, hopefully maybe, maybe he could go see his other friend from childhood, Jenny Wade. And so... Wesley, of course, never got that chance. He was killed on Culp's Hill. But unbeknownst to him, Jenny Wade was also killed at Gettysburg. She is the only civilian to be killed during this battle, which is kind of remarkable. There were a lot of bullets flying through the town. Uh, if you visit Gettysburg and you look at the buildings, there are buildings that show bullet damage, bullet holes in the walls and things like that, artillery shells uh, that went through walls as well. <clears throat> but in Jenny's case, she happened to be uh, doing what many of the women did, uh, we read about Tilly Pierce at the beginning of uh, our discussion on day one, and Jenny, like many other women in town, was taking care of the soldiers, helping to care for them, baking bread for them, uh, and while Jenny was baking bread, a bullet came through the door of her house and pierced her in the back, and she was killed. So, sadly, all three of these friends would be killed by the end of the Battle of Gettysburg. And so that's a sad sort of a sad story, but one that kind of shows as well kind of what it would be like and makes you think, boy, these guys were good friends before the war and they ended up fighting on separate sides. So if you can imagine that, and we're going to see another story here uh, as we wrap things up that kind of highlights that idea as well. So getting back to uh, what's going on on the battlefield, Lee has decided that he tried to attack the left flank of the Union Army on Little Round Top. He had tried to attack the right flank of the Union Army on Culp's Hill. So he hadn't been able to get around the Union Army. He hadn't been successful with these flanking maneuvers that he was trying. So what he decided is they made the flanks pretty strong. There's got to be a weak spot somewhere. It's not on the left. It's not on the right. So it has to be in the middle. Okay? So that's what he decides to do next. He decides he's going to attack the center of the Union line. And if he's successful, he would split the Union army in two. So that's his plan. It was Lee's belief that to reinforce Little Round Top and Culp's Hill, General Meade must have pulled troops from the center of the Union line. And therefore, the center of the Union position should be weak, and Lee would be able to divide the Union army in two. He'd be able to go right through the center, split the Union army, and destroy it one piece at a time. The center of the Union line was on Cemetery Ridge. It's a small rise in the land. It really doesn't look like much of a hill or a ridge. Uh, although if you walk across the field, you do realize that you're climbing, especially as you get toward that uh, Union position. So again, the Union has the higher ground, has the better position. The Confederate Army would have to march across almost a mile of open land to attack that position. So it was a very long march. It was a very... Uh, long march in a wide open field. Uh, there were some places where the land would raise or lower, where you'd have some elevation changes, just very slight ones. Uh, if you look behind me, this is what the land looked like. So it looks pretty flat, and it was. Uh, there were a few spots where the Confederates would maybe be slightly obscured as they go in between some rises and depressions in the land. But for the most part, they were in a wide open uh, field the entire mile across. <clears throat> so knowing that, knowing that this was going to be a very long march over open land, Lee decided to order the artillery to bombard that position. Okay, so Confederate artillery opened up around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and they fired for almost an hour and a half to two hours. They fired shot after shot after shot. Uh, it was the largest artillery barrage ever on Union soil, and or on... American soil, and so the uh, the North returned fire for a bit, and then they realized they didn't really need to return fire because all of the Confederate shells were going right over their heads. The Confederates were shooting high, and so most of the shots from the Confederate artillery 
were not doing what we had hoped they would do and destroy the Union lines or open up holes in the Union lines and weaken them, but instead they were having little to no effect. Now, it was said that the thundering of these cannons could be heard in Pittsburgh, which is over 150 miles from Gettysburg. The thundering of the cannons, because of the way the mountains were uh, and the landscape, the topography of the land, if you will, uh, that would reverberate, it would echo back and forth and bounce between the hills. So there are reports that there was this distant rumbling that could be heard even from Pittsburgh. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's a little hard to believe, but it, it's certainly possible uh, with the acoustics the way they are. Uh, and with the sound waves echoing off the mountains. So the man that was chosen to lead this attack, and the attack becomes well known as Pickett's Charge, but the man who's actually in charge is our friend General James Longstreet, who we had talked about yesterday as well, the same uh, General Lee's sort of second-in-command who had led some of the attacks on Little Round Top. So General Longstreet is chosen to lead this assault or lead this charge. So another name for this attack is Longstreet's Assault. It's more commonly known as Pickett's Charge, but sometimes you will hear it called Longstreet's Assault. It's called Pickett's Charge because one of Longstreet's division commanders is General George Pickett, who's right here in the center. Uh, along with him are General Isaac Trimble and General James Johnston Pettigrew. Uh, like Chamberlain Pettigrew uh, was a professor prior to the war. So we had these three gentlemen, these three division commanders, leading this attack for Longstreet's Corps. Now, Pickett gets a lot of the credit, even though the other two men had just as many men under their command. Uh, Pickett was at the center of the attack, so Pickett gets a lot of the credit. And also after the war, Pickett's, Pickett and his wife did a lot of letter writing and campaigning to kind of talk up their case uh, and their courage and their bravery on that day. So General George E. Pickett was a bold soldier, but he had not had many opportunities to prove himself in battle. A lot of times his men found themselves in, held in reserve or just weren't ordered into the center, central parts of the fights at uh, any of the battles they'd been present at before. So he was thrilled, believe it or not, to finally have the opportunity to distinguish himself and his division. He thought this was his chance. This was his chance to show uh, what they could do this was his chance to maybe help win the war for the South, uh, because that's what the South was truly thinking right now. If they could pull this off, this war would end, and they would have their own country. They would have their independence. Whether or not that would have happened, we'll never know, because that's not the way things worked out for the Confederacy uh, here at Gettysburg. So at about 3 o'clock on the afternoon of July 3rd, General Pickett's troops began the long march across the field toward Cemetery Ridge. They left their position in the woods of Seminary Ridge and marched out of the woods and started across the field. They did not stop to fire, and that's important. They, their goal was to get across the field intact as quickly as they could, so they didn't stop to fire on their way. After marching about halfway across the field, they came under fire from the Union muskets, a little over halfway, actually, uh, but they were in musket range, and the North actually held their fire until they got even a little closer for the most part because they wanted to make sure that their Follies were as deadly as possible. They were slowed down when they reached a road that they and they had to cross a fence. That road's called the Emmitsburg Road. So they got to the Emmitsburg Road and they had a fence to cross. So they had to take down the fence. Still, Pickett's men marched on toward the stone wall that sheltered the Union Army. Now, when farmers plowed their fields in these days, what they did a lot of times was take all the stones and things that they would turn up while plowing sort of pile them all on one side of the field and it made sort of a natural little fence. So the Union had this stone wall to sort of hide behind and use for cover and protection. So they continued on. Many of the men never made it to that wall and no man who crossed the wall returned unharmed. Every man who reached that wall on Cemetery Ridge was either killed, wounded, or captured. They were all casualties. Uh, in this battle, every soldier who hit that stone wall, who got to the stone wall, and like I said, many of them never made it that far. There were units in Pickett's group that had three out of four men in the unit killed, three out of four men in the brigade or company. So extremely high casualty rate. Uh, and there's a reason for that. This is really the end of the frontal assault as a military tactic. Uh, 
This was what had worked in years past, in previous wars. This is how an army would win a battle. Uh, you'd send large numbers of men all packed tightly together across a field. They would overtake the enemy position and they would be won. But technology had been changing. And the technology that was in the hands of the Union Army especially, and the Confederate Army as well, uh, was now a newer, better weapon with a newer, better bullet. So we had rifled muskets firing a type of bullet called a mini ball. And all of those things combined to make these weapons much more deadly and effective at a much greater distance. They were at very, very accurate weapons. These things were easily accurate at 300 yards and in the hands of a good shot even further. So the guns were much, much more accurate. The older guns, maybe 50 to 100 yards tops. So we're talking about at least three times that distance with these guns. So they started to realize a frontal assault like this, what we see at Pickett's Charge, wasn't really effective anymore. Now, I had mentioned General Pickett uh, fighting under Longstreet along with Colonel or Generals Trimble and Pettigrew. Now General Pickett's division had General Pickett in command, of course, and then beneath him, some of the people you'll see if you watch the Gettysburg movie clips, you're gonna see a man named General James Kemper, another named General Lewis Armistead, and a third named General Richard Garnett. And those were the brigade commanders. Remember, we talked about the difference or those levels between uh, corps, division, brigade, regiment, company. So his brigade commanders were these three gentlemen. Okay. So I want to show you just kind of a little animation or a little model of how this would unfold. So what ended up happening is we have this scene here. And you'll see we have the stone wall. We have the Union line behind the stone wall. That's the blue. There's this little group of trees here. This is called the Copse of Trees. And that was the focal point for the Confederate Army. They were trying to converge all three divisions. John or Pettigrew, Trimble, and Pickett were all supposed to sort of come toward that spot. Okay, So that was the spot where they were hoping to break through the line. You also see here the Emmitsburg Road drawn across. So we have those three areas uh, on the battlefield. So what would happen is the Confederates would come out of the woods. We had General Garnett and General Kemper in front with General Armistead behind them. They changed direction a few times. They wanted to kind of deceive the enemy, make them think they were coming from a different way. And then they get to that road and they have to slow down. They have to take this fence down or get across this fence. That was also the Union's sort of cue to fire. When they got to that fence, that was when the North knew they were going to start firing because the South would have to stop. So what happens is they fire their muskets as the South tries to come through. And we're going to see some holes open up in those lines. So especially in those front two brigades, General Garnett, General Kemper, have, uh, have some holes opening up, some gaps opening up in their lines. But they press on. They continue on. And then what we see is General Armistead, especially since he was in the back and had a little more protection, makes it across the stone wall, along with many of the men in his brigade. And there's fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. People using, again, bayonets or swinging their rifles as clubs or even fist fights all breaking out. But if you recall, I said none of the men who crossed that wall would return unharmed. Everybody was, was a casualty, either killed, wounded, or now captured by the Union Army and sent to a prison camp which was a very, very tough place to be. Even though you had survived, Civil War prisons were very, very dangerous places. Uh, they weren't very clean. A lot of the soldiers who went there became very sick and died as well. <clears throat> so that was sort of how Pickett's charge unfolded. Now, during the charge, there are two men. One of them is General Armistead that we just saw. The other is the Union commander, General Hancock, General Winfield Scott Hancock. So we have General Lewis Armistead fighting with Pickett, Winfield Hancock fighting in the Second Corps of the Union Army, which was right behind the stone wall, right by that copse of trees. Uh, and these two gentlemen are going to be facing off against one another. And it so happens that these two gentlemen were the best of friends before the Civil War broke out. Armistead, uh, by some reports, was not the most likable fellow, not the easiest person to get along with, but he had one really good friend, and that was General Winfield Scott Hancock. 
Uh, and actually another friend or another person who used to spend time with them was John Fulton Reynolds, who we saw on the first day of Gettysburg uh, falling in battle shortly after his arrival to help General Buford. But Hancock and Armistead were very, very close, very good friends. They had fought in the Mexican-American War together. They had served in California together uh, and done some things on the frontier prior to the Civil War back in the 1850s. So if you can imagine the two very closest, best of friends that you know, and imagine that a war had broken out and they were fighting on opposite sides. So just a remarkable sort of thing. It's hard to imagine fighting against your best friend like that or uh, taking up arms against them. And that's what these two guys had to do. Armistead was a Virginian. Hancock was a Pennsylvanian. They both fought for their home states. So that's what's going on here. Uh, and Armistead had made Hancock a promise the night before they sort of had to separate and go their separate ways, their last night together at the same fort. And Armistead promised Hancock, if I ever raise my hand against you, Lo, or Armistead had promised Hancock, if I ever raise my hand against you in battle, win, may God strike me dead. And sadly, uh, for General Armistead, that's exactly what happened. This was the first time in those two years of fighting thus far that they had encountered each other on the battlefield where their troops had been directly across from one another. Uh, <clears throat> so that promise uh, that Armistead made became fulfilled here. Uh, and Hancock actually was also severely wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg uh, during this charge as well. So again, another story it's those kinds of things that I really find fascinating studying the Civil War. And there's lots more. These guys are pretty well known. Uh, but there's lots of little stories like that that if you really start digging, you find all kinds of neat little things uh, and neat little stories about characters and personalities and some of those sorts of things. So it's definitely worth looking into. Now, this wasn't the end of the war. Remember, Gettysburg was in the middle of the Civil War. It wasn't the end. It was what they call a turning point. So at this point, the Union started to realize, hey, we can beat General Lee. He's not invincible. So let's keep fighting. Okay? And after about two more years, the North would finally win the Civil War. So Gettysburg, remember, was not an ending here. And if you're following along with me in the packet, uh, it says this brought an end to the three terrible days of Gettysburg. Civil War would rage on for nearly two more years. Many more lives would be lost or forever changed as a result. Lee would never again bring his army as far north as he had during the Battle of Gettysburg. Following the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union army became more successful. They began to win more battles, largely due to the continued leadership of General George Meade, as well as that of General Ulysses S. Grant. And General Grant would take over as the overall command commander of the Union army. Grant was fighting in the western part of the country, or at least what was the west then, which was actually Mississippi, uh, Tennessee, those types of areas. But General Grant was fighting in those areas. In fact, the day after the Battle of Gettysburg, the South surrendered one of their major ports in Vicksburg, Mississippi, to General Grant. So General Grant and General Meade together were doing some pretty great things for the Union Army. Uh, Grant, of course, would later be elected as our nation's 18th president. The Battle of Gettysburg in our own state of Pennsylvania was a key part of the Civil War and ultimately helped to keep the United States together as one country. So to wrap up, there's one other really famous thing that happened as a result of the Battle of Gettysburg, and of course that is the Gettysburg Address, which Abraham Lincoln delivered on November 19, 1863. On November 19, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln visited Gettysburg. He came to dedicate a portion of the Gettysburg battlefield as a national cemetery. This cemetery was used to bury the many brave Union soldiers who had died during the Battle of Gettysburg. Lincoln's speech lasted only two minutes. The man who had spoken before him gave a speech that lasted over two hours. Lincoln worried that he had failed and that no one had liked his speech. Lincoln was wrong. People st loved his speech and still remember it today, over 150 years later.
and maybe more by the time you're watching this because I'm counting this as 2019. So, so I want to go over with you, first of all, this is the only known picture of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. Nobody even at the time uh, took the time to photograph the president giving this speech, but there was one picture taken sort of as the ceremony was wrapping up, and there's Abraham Lincoln in the circle you see there. Uh, so kind of amazing for us to think about too today, as common as cameras are and things. Uh, that's something that really wasn't even thought of as something worth taking a picture of at that point. And it was hard to take pictures of things outdoors and things in motion. Uh, there's all kinds of things that go along with the technology that made that difficult. But I want to wrap up here, I think, with, our, uh, with, with the text from the Gettysburg Address, because there's a lot of things in there that really kind of explain what Lincoln was thinking, uh, what he wanted the country to be thinking. It was kind of his way to remind the country of why they were fighting, remind the, especially the civilians, of why it was important to continue this war, why this war needed to go on, even though it was very sad and even though many men had died. Uh, so he does a good job sort of going through that. So if you listen, we'll uh, kind of break it down one section at a time. So it begins, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So what Lincoln is saying that four score and seven years ago is a fancy way to say 87 years ago. A score is 20 years. So when he says four score and seven, that's four score, that's four times 20 is 80, and seven. 87 years ago. So 87 years ago was the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Lincoln goes on to quote the Declaration of Independence. So he has, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, which are Jefferson's words from the Declaration of Independence. He's reminding our country that this is what we were founded on. This is what our beliefs are, that all men are created equal. He continues, now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that that nation might live. So again, he's reminding the country of what we're doing. Why are we fighting this war? Why are we here at Gettysburg? Uh, four months after the battle, well, we're here to dedicate this field, make sure that there's always a spot for those who died here to rest. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. He's saying that it's really not up to us. This land is already sacred. This land is already an amazing place because of the men who fought here and died here. He says, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And I believe he's right. Look at us uh, today, still remembering the brave acts of those soldiers at Gettysburg on both sides, north and south. He goes on to say, it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. There's a lot of work left to do. And it's up to us. We have to be dedicated to finishing that task, dedicated to seeing this through. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So again, Lincoln is reminding the people watching, the people who will read this in the newspapers, that even though this war is tough, even though things are very difficult to lose family members, lose neighbors, lose loved ones, we can't give up. We have to stay dedicated. We have to stay the course and win this war because the people who have already given their lives, 
You can't let them die for nothing. That's what it means when he says, these dead shall not have died in vain. We need to finish what we started. We need to win this war, and we need to make sure that this nation that we've created, this nation that was given to us by our founding fathers, doesn't end here. This nation needs to go on. So uh, he reminds us that it's the government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's the nation where we vote for our offices, uh, vote for our leaders. So it was a pretty special thing, pretty important thing, and still is to this day. Uh, so we're very lucky to live in the United States of America, and that's what Lincoln was sort of reminding everybody here with the Gettysburg Address. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, these videos. I hope you've used them to kind of help you learn a bit about the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, if you've been following along and watching along with the movie clips that sort of go along, uh, this clip would start with the artillery barrage. So uh, the movie actually shows Joshua and Thomas Chamberlain meeting together sort of right at the center of the battlefield. Uh, and that's not true. That's Hollywood sort of changing the story a little bit to make it more interesting, more exciting. Show us these characters that we've come to care about uh, after seeing what we saw in Little Round Top yesterday. So they actually start with Joshua Chamberlain and Thomas Chamberlain coming together. Uh, they learn what happened to their friend Sergeant Kilrain uh, as well. So, and then they go right into the artillery brunch. So that's where I have the kids uh, in my classes start the film. Uh, for this third segment, the artillery barrage begins. We see some of the discussions about things and where they're going. We see the Confederate troops coming out of the field or coming out of the woodlands and marching across that field. So uh, from this point, I'd watch all the way through to the end of the movie. Uh, and certainly if you have time and you're watching at home, definitely take the time to watch the whole thing. Uh, at school, we don't quite have time to do that. Uh, so those of you who are my students that are watching this, uh, we aren't going to be able to watch the whole thing, but definitely take the time if you're interested and you've enjoyed this sort of stuff, take the time to find that movie and watch watch the rest of it, watch the parts we didn't get to watch at school. Again, I hope everybody's enjoyed learning about the Battle of Gettysburg. Hopefully maybe this inspires you to read about some other battles and learn about some other parts of the Civil War as well. Uh, there's so many different things, so many different areas you could explore, uh, and so many great resources out there to use to do it. So. Uh, one of the great ones that I have been meaning to mention is the Civil War Preservation Trust, or now it's actually the American Battlefield Trust. And that's a group that is dedicated to preserving land where soldiers had fought, not only in the Civil War, but also the Revolutionary War, anywhere in America where there was fighting. Uh, these folks are working hard, raising money to buy that land, so we make sure that that land is there for us to visit, because it's a great way to learn uh, about the past, is to stand and walk in these folks' footsteps. Uh, but the American Battlefield Trust has some animated battle maps on YouTube. I'm going to try to post a link uh, to some of those, especially the one for the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, so that would definitely be something worth checking out. And again, thank you for watching. Hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.